Take our Bibles and turn to the book of Joshua. This week we will be reading the passage that our monthly memory verse is from. And so this morning I want to bring a lesson. Uh, actually, it's kind of more of a challenge uh, from, that, from the, the, that verse and the verses around it. Um, so we'll be looking at Joshua, Joshua chapter 1 as we get started. And we'll read the first um, nine verses to get the context of things. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, into the, unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, uh, from the, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coasts. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. So the, the beginning of Joshua is, of course, kind of the beginning of a new era. In fact, um, Way back in Exodus 1 or 2 or 3, Moses is introduced to us, and we've been with Moses for the last four books of the Bible, and some of them quite long. Um, and actually, the children of, I mean, Moses is introduced to us as a child, and then we, we have his whole life there. The children of Israel have been with Moses for, um, as a leader of some sort or another, for 80 years. He um, he does go off into the wilderness himself and then comes back and he's with them in the wilderness for 80 year, uh, 40 years. Um, and, and then Moses dies. God does not allow Moses to go into the land of um, blessing and, and he goes up on the mountain. God buries him. And the Bible says, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass. This it's actually interesting, linguistically, or, or in, the, in the language, these verses, um, the very first word of Joshua ties Joshua to what we've been reading in Deuteronomy. And what is said there ties Joshua to it. It's very uh, close connection. And in one sense, that's very important. If you think to the children of Israel, they revered. Um, we might say some of them worship. They wouldn't have gone that far, but they greatly revered Moses, and it's important to um, scriptures and to them that they see that Joshua flowed right from the same place that Moses came from, and he's connected to him in the same way. Um, we'll see that, I think I pointed this out back last year, but we see that at the end of the book, too, that Joshua's writings are put right, right next to Moses' writings, because they're, rec they they're recognized as being from God, just like Moses is. But... So this is the beginning of Joshua's leadership. It's the start of a new era, and we have some important instructions here at the beginning. Now, it's not really anything new, because Joshua had been leading for many, many years. He'd led against the Amalekites way 40 years before, um, and all this. So Joshua is not in a, do, he's not doing anything new. It's just kind of a, 
a new perspective on things. And what we see here is that God tells Joshua to be strong and to be courageous. He tells him that in verse 6, be strong and of a good courage. And then he tells him it again in verse 7, only be thou strong and very courageous. And then in verse 9, have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. It's interesting that God says to Joshua three times, be strong and be courageous. It's also kind of interesting, I think, that uh, just four chapters previous or three chapters previous, turn back to Deuteronomy 31. Deuteronomy 31, Moses is speaking. And he, said, he spoke to all Israel and said unto them these things. I'm 120 years old this day. This, that's verse, one, uh, verse 2. And, um, and, Josh, and verse um, 3, Joshua, he shall go over before thee, as the Lord has said, and the Lord shall do to them as he did to Sihon. And verse 5, the Lord shall give them up before your face. Verse 6, be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua, verse 7, and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage. And there's a few other places, actually, in Deuteronomy where we see this phrase, Be strong and of a good courage. But we have three times here in four verses in the first chapter of um, Joshua. And I want us just to think about these, this idea. Uh, first off, the idea of being strong and being courageous. Uh, being strong, we could think of as being an external thing. Maybe, you know, uh, it's external. How, how, how is it that we get to be strong? I know right now how you get to be weak is you don't exercise. <laughs> you don't get up and do what you should do. But how, how is it do, that we get strong? Um, when I, many years ago, when I was on the wrestling team, we would go into the weight room, and you could, you know, bench press or do all these exercises. If I wanted to get strong, if I really wanted to get strong, I wouldn't go to the weight room once a year. I really wouldn't get very, become very strong if I went once a day and did one repetition. Right? Now, ladies, maybe you don't understand this, but all the men are going to nod in their heads. It takes repetitions. It takes reps. you got to do 10. And there's all different kinds of um, schemes you could do. It. 12, 10, 8, you know, whatever. You could, all kinds of different ways. But every, everything that has to do with becoming strong is doing multiples of it, doing repetitions of it. That's how you become strong. Um, and that's how you become a strong weightlifter if you want to become any other type of strong athlete, you do many times the right thing in that, you know, if you want, you shoot hundreds, thousands of free throws, right? Or whatever, whatever sport it is, and that's physical. Um, but what about, so, so that's how you become strong. How does sin become strong in our lives? We do it a bunch of times, right? We give in to it. We, you know, a person doesn't set out to become an alcoholic or a drunk, but he drinks a little bit. Then he drinks a little bit more. He does it often enough, and he begins to be good at drinking, right? Now, it's, it's, that's not the right way to think about it, but he does it, and pretty soon that, sin, that alcohol has a grip on him because he's done it, drunk it so often. It's repetition. And so becoming strong at something pretty much is a matter of doing it over and over and over again. Whether it's a sinful stronghold, whether it's a physical um, skill, even if it's, you know, ladies, even if it's typing. And that's, I type too, so I'm not trying to but I don't think many ladies are in the weight room just bulking up. Um, 
But whatever that physical skill is, you do, you do it over and over and over and over and over again, and you become stronger at it. You become better at it. And, same, and, and that's what happens with sin. Sin gets strong in our lives when we allow it, when we do it over and over again. But that's what happens with spiritual strength also. You cannot become spiritually strong if you come to church once a month or once whenever. You need to do it over and over and over again. Uh, if you read your Bible, you know, once, once whenever, I think of it. Reading our Bible is something that allows us to become stronger, but we need repetition in it. We need to do it in a regular time. And for that matter, as far as the outward uh, strength is considered, the more you do something, the stronger you get at it. Um, there's all kinds of different exercises we could think of. We could put apply this to uh, the academic realm, right? Going to school and, and doing, you're gonna become smarter if you read the encyclopedia once a year. You know, nobody, I don't think anybody's doing that, but if you read the encyclopedia every day, you're gonna be even more smarter, right? Um, social, even your, if, if you um, are like, I'm, I'm afraid to shake hands with visitors here before Sunday school. You say, say, well, once a month I'm going to do it. Okay? Well, you're not going to get very good at it. You're not going to become uh, very strong at it. Um, you say, well, every Sunday morning I'm going to do it. Well, still, it's going to be hard every Sunday morning. But if you make yourself say hi to somebody you don't really know every day, right? So you, that would be a social skill. Um, physical skills we talked about, spiritual skills. All these things are... Um, Basically, external things, things that we can measure that we do, but um, spiritual skills like Bible reading. We mentioned that already. Bible study, Bible meditation, Bible memory, praying, confessing sin, denying self. All of these things are, are activities that we can tell if we've done them or not. And we can, in some way, the spiritual ones maybe less, but even these external type things, we can kind of measure what we've done. It's external. But, so, so that would be, uh, in a sense, compared to the, fr to the phrase, be strong. But he also says, be courageous. He says, be strong and be courageous. And courage is more what I would think of, of an internal thing. And um, somebody that I heard speak on this said, the, um, the be strong was get strong, the be courageous was get serious. Don't let your mind just, um, and they're not separate commands. It's not that we can be strong and not be courageous, or we can be courageous and not be strong. We're to do, they're given together, they work together. Really, if we have the external in our lives, if we have all these external things and we're not serious, we're not courageous in, our, in, the, in, in the inside, um, it's just a sham routine. It's just a show. Um, but courage is not an external show. Courage comes from internal resolution. So, we have these commands, two commands that God, Moses, gave to the people and to Joshua, and God here gives to Joshua three times, kind of in three different areas. Um, and we'll see this. He says, to get strong and to get serious. Or he says, be strong and and be courageous. And the first area, first time we see him say this in this passage is verse 6. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. All right, so he says, get strong, be strong, be courageous. You are going to divide the land as an inheritance to the people. Why didn't Moses divide the land as an inheritance to the people? Um, not 40 years before, though. The land could have been divided to them 40 years before. You're right, but I, I would just ask the question not as clear as I wanted to. Why wasn't the land divided to them 40 years before? And Moses would have been the one to do it at that time. A lack of courage. What were they afraid of? Somebody's saying it, I hear it. Class? Giants. There were giants in the land. There's giants. We're but grasshoppers in their sight. 
And, and we felt like grasshoppers, and, and they thought we looked like grasshoppers. There's giants in the land. So were there giants in the land now? There were still giants in the land. But so, so God said to, to Joshua, be strong, be courageous, kill the giants. You're going to take this land, you're going to divide it up. In order to do that, you've got to defeat the giants. You've got to eliminate the enemies. There's all things throughout Scripture talking about this, but um, actually in Numbers, God told them, you're go you need to eliminate the enemies, drive them out of the land. If you don't, they're going to become, um, what do you say, pricks and snares in your eyes and your feet and whatever. And what happens in Judges, that's what we see happen. They didn't actually do it. But we have to deal with, um, in, in conquering the land, we have to, we have to conquer the giants. And in our lives, we have giants that come into our lives. We have giants in our lives. We have things that we have to deal with. Every one of us has, uh, all of us, all, everything that we have to deal with is common to man. It's not like our giant is any different than everybody else's giant. But some of us, the giant we deal with, is, the giant I deal with might not be the one that Brian deals with, but it's, maybe it's the one that Todd deals with. Or, or in that sense, we all have giants that we have to deal with, and we have to, we have to defeat the enemy. We have to drive out the enemy. Some of us deal with worry. We have this giant of worry. We're always worried. Other people deal with sensuality. Other people get angry over things. Other people have bitterness, a giant of bitterness in their life that, they, uh, that conquers them. Um, greed, ambition, self-dependence, this to total dependence on self. Whatever it is, we have these things in our life that... that uh, conquer us and hold us captive, and we have to drive them out of our life. I know I'm drawing a parallel here, but I think it's a, 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 a good parallel. God said, be strong, be courageous, conquer the land. And part of conquering the land was getting rid of the, rid of the giants. Um, we, have to, we have to be strong. We have to, ha we have to get strong uh, in, in what we do, and we have to be serious. We have to be courageous. We have, you know, our heart has to be right about fighting enemies. And one thing we'll find out, uh, when we conquer, when we drive out, when we defeat a giant, what did David find out about the giant he defeated? He had brothers. So we defeat this giant, we think, ah, oh, life will be easy now. No, his brother's coming after you. Now, it's, maybe he's not as big, comes, comes from a different city, but we're always going to have to fight the world and um, drive out these enemies because our heart is wicked. It's desperately wicked. It can, be, it can be changed, but it has to continually be changed. And, and so, where's my... Sorry. So we should, we should take courage and, and determine to be strong to fight these enemies. Sometimes we um, think, can't life be easy? Well, life, not, not all of life is easy. There's hard parts. There's things that are not, um, that don't feel good, that we have, to, we have to go through in order to have a great life. Some, a guy illustrated it this way. You, you like the cookies, right? Um, but there's certain ingredients that go into cookies that you just don't like. I don't even know how to make the cookies. But you put something in there. If I was to eat that one ingredient, it's like, eh, that's not, that doesn't taste good. I know there's sugar in there, but there's something else in there. Ladies could help me out, but you, you know, there's salt. I'm just going to eat salt, you know, or whatever. All the parts that make up a good cookie, we don't like individually. And it's just a food illustration, but... All the parts that make up a good life, a successful Christian life, individually, you know, as they're entered into our life, the, we don't always like it. The, there's some great sweet things in our life, but there's always some, there are some battles and, and struggles and trials that come into our life that we're not going to like it, but it's what God has designed for us to become, uh, to have a, a successful and joyful life. All right, we need to move along because there's two more times when he said, be strong. So verse seven, 
Then he says, Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. It goes on through verse 7 and into verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So the second realm of our life that he talks about when he says be strong and of good, of good courage is the law of God. Um, is, um, thou mayest observe to do all the law, mastering the word of God. He had to observe all of it and to turn not from it to the right hand or the left. It wasn't to depart out of his, lo- out of his mouth. Um, so what is, we... Um, Mastering the law or having the word of God in our lives in this way, what this to me helps should teach us is that the word of God should be the centerpiece of our life. The word of God should be the centerpiece of our life. Everything that we look at, whether it is a job or something at our job or um, entertainment or some social activity, or ministry, spiritual activity, all of these things, we should filter everything that we do in our life through the Word of God. The way we look at it should be filtered through the Word of God. We live by the Word of God. We read that this week, didn't we? And Jesus quoted it uh, in Matthew, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of of God. Um, Romans 12.2 teaches us that we have to renew our minds with the Word of God. So that would be that we, we need to uh, have the Word of God freely available to us. We need to master the Word. It needs to be something that, is, that we, in a sense, have close at hand and able to use. The Word shows us the wonder and beauty of God. It shows us the promises of God. It shows us the work of God on Calvary. It shows us the work of the Spirit of God in our lives and in lives around us. It gives us a reason for living. If we are not being transformed by the Word of God, we will be conformed to the world. You know, the verse says, be be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. But if we're not being transformed by the Word, if we're not strong in the Word of God, and if we're not serious about the Word of God, if it's not internal to us, if if we're not being transformed by the Word, then we will be conformed to the world. Um, Christians in the world around us, and we see it uh, externally, but we see it in our own lives, and we've always, I I need to remind myself also, we've always seen this. Um, We see it mostly with young people, but even with us older fogies, we get allured by the world. We get drawn that way. Young people are not as anchored, they're not as strong, even though they want to think they are, but um, Christians are being devoured by the culture, the fashions, the materialism, the philosophy, the mindset, the worldview of the world, because they're not strong in the Word of God. So, to be strong in God's Word, we need a routine, right? We need to do some things that would be kind of external, like reading the Bible, studying the Bible, and we need exercises, but then we need to be serious about it. We, need, we can't just read the Bible, say, well, I'm following the, the, the plan, I'm checking it off, but if that doesn't become a part of our life, if we don't apply the Bible to ourselves, if we, don't, um, if we treat it as just like checking it off or learning it for a test or something like that, um, or to be able to make sure that we get the glass at the end of February. Um, there's nothing wrong with encouragement. That's great. But if, if you're reading the Bible so that um, when somebody comes to you and says, hey, where are you? You can say, well, I've finished Deuteronomy 20 this morning. Um, so that they think you're a good person. You're not internalizing what's going on. You are doing it, which is good. You're going to get some benefit from it, but you're not going to be courageous with it. You're not, going to, you're not serious about it, even though you're going through the motions of it. So then, so if we need to get strong and get serious about 
um, defeating, conquering our land, our life, gaining control, giving God control of our life, and that would be defeating giants in our lives. We need to get strong and get serious about the Word of God and master it. And then our verse uh, for this month, have not I commanded thee, verse 9, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And to me, I see trust in God here. He says, be strong, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed. I am with you wherever you go. In everything that you're facing, I'm there. Be not afraid. Some people say they have a hard time trusting God. I have a hard time trusting God. If you have a hard time trusting God, you don't know God. When I have a hard time trusting God, I'm not thinking about God the way I should. I don't know him the way I should. We should remember that God doesn't need permission to mess up our lives. He knows what's good for us. Here's a question. When you're in trouble, where do you turn for help? Where do you turn for help? Do you turn to God? Do you turn to friends? Do you turn to the government? Do you go, there's, there's a lot of different places, a lot of different kinds of problems would make us um, point us in different directions. But we should turn to God for help first, especially for our spiritual problems. Um, an illustration was once given about a guy that goes to Walmart looking for something that Walmart doesn't sell. Looks all over the place, can't find it. Says, well, I'll, then, then he comes back a week later and looks for it again. And he comes back a week later and looks for it again. It's not there. He's going to the wrong place. And when we go to the wrong place for worry and for problems that we face in our lives, we don't, we don't get the answer, but what do we as human be, beings do? <laughs> we keep going to the place that doesn't have the answer. God's the one that has the answer. Go to him for it. Trust him. You say, well, it doesn't, what God says doesn't make sense. Does it make sense to march around Jericho seven times, in, you know, 13 times? And it doesn't make sense. But it's God's way. So who do you call for help? And how quickly do you call for, for that help. God wants to help us. He doesn't look upon us as um, unworthy beings, as scumballs, as just like, he does not despise us. He loves us. He wants to help us. It's, it gives him joy to help us. Um, and so we should, we should make ourselves think of trusting God every day. We need daily renewal. We need cross-bearing. We, we need to grow in grace. We need to trust God for more than salvation. Even our motives and our purpose and our attitude, we need to be trusting God and growing in our trust of God, trusting the Lord. So being strong has to do, has to do with, um, in our lesson today, has to do with uh, the, the outward things that we do. And being courageous has to do with the way we think about it, being serious in our lives. And we need to, um, with these passages, we see that there's the, the land that we need to be strong and be serious about. There's the word of God that we need to be strong and be serious about. And there's our trust in the Lord that we need to be strong and be serious about. And um, this, was, this was a, a good reminder for myself as I remembered the... Um, this lesson that I've given in the past, and it was helpful for me, and I hope it was for you too.